Welcome everyone to the Economy Ninja Podcast. This is your host, Colin Nordman, and I am really excited to launch this podcast series. Let me give you a little background about myself and what I want this podcast to be about. I am an engineer, but after many years of punching numbers into calculators, I was realizing how little I knew about other topics in the world. Like when it came to investing, I kept hearing the same phrases, you know, don't try to beat the market. Just buy and hold that index fund until retirement. Print go burr. Assets go up. Well, I wasn't satisfied with those being the extent of my knowledge on investing. And if that's how you feel, then you've come to the right place. So what I want to do is to dive deep into history, explore some science, crunch some numbers, and when I'm done with all that digging, I will share those juicy nuggets of knowledge right here with you. This podcast is going to start off in the world of markets and economies. Again, I am no expert in finance, and I will not be providing investment advice, but I'll do my best to break down concepts that I introduce. All right. It's time to get down to business. Today, we're going to talk about money in the United States. This is a fairly broad topic. So to do this, we're going to have to talk about physical money and money supply. But to get enough background, we're going to have to go over some history. So if you think you understand money, you think it's pretty straightforward, then prepare yourself for this little rabbit hole. Where does money come from? Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution established the powers of Congress. Of those powers is the power to coin and regulate the value of physical money. To accomplish that, Congress established the U.S. Treasury, and it was the Coinage Act of 1792 that established the U.S. Mint and created the dollar system. The dollar system was a gold, silver, and copper-based monetary system where the dollar coin was set to 24.1 grams of pure silver. And gold was used for denominations worth more than $1 up to a $10 coin called the Gold Eagle, which was set to 16 grams of pure gold. Copper was used for the one cent and the half cent that existed at the time. Great news, right? Everybody likes gold. <laughs> well, how do we go from this bimetallic gold and silver standard in 1792 to the pieces of paper that we have today? It turns out precious metals used as sovereign currency are difficult to maintain because of something known as Gresham's Law. This is where bad money drives good money out of circulation. So not long after 1792, the market price of silver declined, so people started hoarding gold coins because they were worth more, and they only spent the silver coins into the economy. So the better money, in this case the gold, was driven out of circulation. There's a psychological separation that begins between gold and silver around this time, where gold becomes the preferred stored of value. It's perceived to be better money. Throughout the 19th century, gold became a popular money of choice held by central governments around the world. And as a result, gold became the asset used to settle trade imbalances, effectively putting the world on a gold standard. All right, so where, where's the paper money? Well, versions of paper money issued against species of precious metals had been around since before the Revolutionary War in the United States. In fact, for a long time, it seemed like every bank had its own paper money. And this is understandable, as we find paper money is much more convenient to carry around and transact with compared to heavier metal money. Now, it wasn't until the Civil War that paper money, specifically the U.S. dollar, started to really, being, uh, really be circulated. And why is that? 
Well, that's because wars are very, very expensive. And they're excellent at creating significant amounts of government debt in the process. When a government's debt burden rises, they have to pay for it, uh, either with their reserves or uh, debase or devalue the currency to be able to service the debt. Devaluing the currency, in this case, was accomplished by temporarily halting the convertibility of paper notes for gold or silver, and then continue to issue more paper U.S. dollars at the same time. This is a significant tool throughout history used by governments that may save a country at a time of crisis, but it comes at the cost of destroying wealth in its economy and the wealth of its citizens. Now we can introduce money supply. In the era of gold standards, there is a maximum uh, to the money supply that is directly proportional to the gold supply. The money supply is often a multiple of the amount of gold held in bank reserves in an economy. And the multiple is dependent on something called fractional reserve banking, where fractional reserve banking means only a set fraction of the total deposits at a bank need to be available for withdrawal. The rest of the money that exists in the bank as deposits is available for the bank to lend out for a profit. But don't worry, we, we will come back to this. As wonderful as the gold standard seemed, it had limitations, especially when there were wars and government spending soared. As a result, <clears throat> when there were economic panics, everyone would rush to take their cash out of the system in what's known as a run on the bank. This is where fractional reserve banking runs into serious problems. Things don't go well when everyone wants their money back at the same time. Many people would be left with nothing, and there was no protection, uh, as this was before the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation existed uh, to protect savers. The knock-on effect of a run on the bank was that there would be no money left to lend out into the economy. So the money supply craters, and there's a painful recession. In fact, there were so many economic panics of the 19th century that it spurred support for the establishment of a central bank in the U.S. with the passing of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. This, would be, this wouldn't be the first time that the United States had established a central bank, but the scope of the Federal Reserve Act would give the central bank staying power until today, over 100 years later. The Fed was established by Congress with a dual mandate of maintaining price stability and maximizing employment. However, only a year would pass before the world was engulfed in the Great War, starting in 1914. The gold standard was no longer capable of operating in a world at war. Government deficits exploded, and this time it would be the central banks of the world that would become the primary financiers of the Great War. Following the war, the United States returned to the gold standard and saw a new era of growth in the United States, and with it, the sense of unlimited prosperity. This jubilation, however, bred all manner of speculative behaviors, and this decade of the roaring 1920s came to an abrupt end with the great stock market crash of 1929. Again, a massive crisis, and this time with mass joblessness and significant deflation. And this lasted for years. So the government went back to its toolbox. But this time, the deflation was so rampant and lasted so long that merely suspending the convertibility of the U.S. dollar for gold would not be enough. This prompted President Roosevelt to establish an executive order in 1933, this time ordering all citizens to turn in all of their gold in exchange for U.S. dollars. This was followed with the signing of the Gold Reserve Act of 1934, which transferred ownership of all gold in the United States to the U.S. Treasury, and at the same time revalued gold 
in U.S. dollars from $20.67 to $35 per ounce. This devalued the dollar 40% in one day. After the initial shock, this did stabilize the U.S. economy until the end of World War II. And it was the ending of World War II that saw the greatest inflows of gold in the U.S. as payments for debts from other countries. And this made the United States the largest holder of gold in the world. That monetary stability made the U.S. dollar the world's reserve currency following the agreement of Bretton Woods. Every country would fix its currency to the U.S. dollar, and the dollar would be fixed to the price of gold. The U.S. dollar maintained its price relationship with gold at a constant $35 per ounce until 1971. There, the U.S. was finding itself in the middle of the Vietnam War and again facing rising government debts. A rush by other countries to convert dollars into gold prompted President Richard Nixon to end the direct convertibility of U.S. dollars for gold, thereby taking the United States and the world with it off the gold standard and onto a global fiat monetary system. And after nearly 50 years, this new world is still writing its story. That's today's podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, please like it, subscribe it. Uh, please tune in for the next episode to hear more on the story of money. There is much more. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, at Economy Ninja, and on YouTube, where I will be uploading the videos uh, recorded with this podcast. Thank you, and have a good day.